This is ARRL Audio News, your weekly summary of news highlights from the world of amateur radio. If you retransmit audio news through a repeater, listen for the Morse code K character, followed by four seconds of silence. That's your cue to stop transmitting so that your repeater timer can reset. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1HSX, and these are our stories for Friday, February 15th. Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, will oversee the development and implementation phases of ARRL's new Volunteer Monitors program, which will replace the Official Observers program. Hollingsworth, who once handled amateur radio enforcement for the FCC, has stepped down as ARRL Atlantic Division Vice Director to avoid any appearance of a conflict of interest. The development phase of the program is already underway. Approved by the ARRL Board of Directors last July, the volunteer monitors will work in cooperation with the FCC. Volunteers trained and vetted by ARRL will monitor the amateur bands for possible instances of misconduct or to recognize exemplary on-air operation. Cases of flagrant violations or noncompliance will be directed to the FCC for action in accordance with FCC guidelines. The program, which aims to re-energize amateur radio enforcement efforts, was proposed by the FCC following the closure of several FCC regional offices and reductions in field staff. Hollingsworth has identified three phases to the program, development, solicitation and training, and implementation. The development phase will include drafting a mission statement, clearly defining ARRLs and the FCC's requirements and needs as part of the program, drafting a volunteer manager job description, and developing a training manual for volunteers. Solicitation and training phase will involve identifying the geographical locations where volunteer monitors will be most needed, soliciting applications, and screening applicants. Current official observers will be invited to apply for appointment as volunteer monitors. Implementation will involve having the volunteers provide field reports and ARRL staff offering guidance to volunteers to ensure that the information gathered meets FCC requirements. Continuing education will be provided to the volunteers as part of the program. ARRL officials estimate that it will take 9 to 12 months before the first volunteer monitors begin filing reports. The U.S. amateur radio population once again grew by about 1% based upon 2017 and 2018 year-end FCC database statistics provided by Joe Speroni, AH0A. The 755,430 total licensees represent nearly 7,300 more ticket holders than those that were in the database at the end of 2017. Nearly 51% of the amateur radio population in the U.S., 384,145, hold a technician license. Generals are second, with 175,949, and amateur extras number 147,369. Advanced and novice licensee populations continue to decline, with 39,607 advanced and 8,360 novices, as the FCC no longer issues advanced or novice licenses. A more significant statistic is 31,576 new FCC licenses last year, although that's 620 fewer than came aboard in 2017. The FCC has invited public comments on a petition for rulemaking from an Ohio amateur seeking to amend the Part 97 station identification rules to better accommodate and simplify station identification during an emergency net, drill, or activation. ARRL member Robert A. Dukish, KK8DX, filed the petition in December, and the FCC put it on public notice this week. Dukish seeks a change to Section 97.119A of the rules, which requires an amateur station to transmit, quote, its assigned call sign on its transmitting channel at the end of each communication and at least every 10 minutes during a communication, unquote. 
He noted that during emergency networks, requiring participating stations, often portable, to use their assigned call signs during each transmission could prove burdensome. Specifically, he is suggesting that a simple approach would be to permit the net control station or other designated participant to announce from a single point the call signs of every station taking part in the net or exercise. The amendment would provide that participating stations be within a 50 mile distance of the identifying station, and each individual station must self identify by transmitting its assigned call sign at least once per hour. CW transmission could be no faster than 25 words per minute if sent automatically to satisfy the suggested amendment. In his petition, Durkish noted petitions filed in 2005 and 2006 seeking changes to the amateur radio station identification rules. The FCC did not adopt either proposal. The call is going out for technical papers to be presented at the ARRL slash TAPR Digital Communications Conference September 20th through the 22nd at the Marriott Detroit Metro Airport Hotel. Papers will also be published in the conference proceedings. Authors do not need to attend the conference to have their papers included in the proceedings. The submission deadline is August 5. Submit your papers via email or mail to Maddie Weinberg, KB1EIB, ARRL, 225 Main Street, Newington, Connecticut, 06111. The email address is maty at arrl.org. Papers will be published exactly as submitted, and authors will retain all rights. Ham Radio 2019 and the 70th Lake Constance Convention, both organized by the Deutsche Amateur Radio Club, will take place Friday, June 21st until Sunday, June 23rd in Friedrichshafen on Lake Constance. An informal meeting for representatives of AIRU member societies will take place on June 21st. Youth Days and a Ham Rally will be held on Friday and Saturday. On Friday evening, three anniversaries will be celebrated 70 years of Lake Constance Conventions, the 90th anniversary of DARC CQDL Journal, and the 44th Ham Radio Gathering. The 2019 ARRL International DX Contest CW Weekend is just ahead, February 16th and 17th, while the SSB Weekend is two weeks later, March 2nd and 3rd. Even if you or your station are not competitive, DX oriented operating events such as these offer the possibility of putting some new DXCC entities into the log, upping your operating skills, or just getting a feel for how well your station and antennas fare on busy bands. U.S. and Canadian operators work as many DX stations and as many DXCC entities as possible on 160, 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meters. DX stations work as many U.S. and Canadian stations in as many of the 48 contiguous states and provinces as possible. U.S. and Canadian stations send a signal report and the state or province, while DX stations send a signal report and the power output. Details are available on the ARRL website at www.arrl.org. And now, with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. AO85 had to be turned off due to the battery health. The next full illumination will be from June 7th through the 19th and then again in September. During this time, the satellite will be in safe mode and the command stations will get telemetry to check the condition of the batteries. Thanks to Mark, N8MH, and Drew, KO4MA, for this update. One of the threads that is getting a lot of mileage on the AMSAT BB is a 400 BPS beacon. For some of the old timers, there was one on AO10, AO13, and AO40. It has been brought back to life. On QO100. Now it might be difficult to hear if you're not somewhere around the Mideast. So, to make it easy for those in the States, there's a website you can go to to take a listen. Visit https colon slash slash e s h a i l dot b a t c dot org dot u k slash n b. That's November Bravo. Bringing some of the old to one of the newest satellites and the first geostationary amateur satellite. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO, for the ARRL Audio News. 
This is the ARRL Audio News Propagation Forecast for Friday, February 15th. HF conditions for this weekend's ARRL CWDX contest are looking reasonably good, despite the fact that we face a spotless sun. Earth is going to take a glancing blow from a stream of solar particles, but the effect should be minor and we should be out of the stream by the time the contest starts. The quiet HF conditions should last well into next week, with the solar flux index at about 70. Look for DX on 160 through 20 meters, and you may also find some openings on 17 and 15 meters. On VHF and UHF, be on the lookout for Tropo on 2 meters and up in southern and central California, and also be on alert in Florida, East Texas, and Arkansas. And that concludes ARRL Audio News for this week. Our thanks to all contributors to this week's report. ARRL Audio News is produced by the American Radio Relay League, the National Association for Amateur Radio. For more information on amateur radio or the ARRL, visit us on the web at ARRL.org. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter by searching for ARRL. If you have a question or comment about ARRL Audio News, email us at audionews.org. News at ARRL.org. This program is copyright ARRL, all rights reserved. 73, and thanks for listening. Foundations of Amateur Radio. The hobby we call amateur radio is enormous. One amateur called it a thousand hobbies in one, and that just about sums it up for me. Being bored inside this hobby is not an option, because there is just so much to do and see. Yesterday, I found a completely unrelated aspect to our hobby. Call it the 1001st hobby associated with amateur radio. A friend came over and handed me the separation kit mount for my Yaesu FT-857D. It's the bit of plastic that you clip to the back of the head of the radio so you can mount it somewhere separate from the main body of the radio. I have one of those already purchased from a local supplier. At the time, eight years ago, it cost me 80 bucks. These days it's included with the radio. For my station I needed a second mount, and I really didn't want to spend that much money on three cables and some plastic, so I went hunting for alternatives. One of my friends is doing some 3D printing R&D for his job, and has access to a printer to do some rapid prototyping, and I wondered if that might be an option. Turns out that I'm late to the party. People have been designing and printing bits for their radios for years. A quick hunt through the popular 3D printing libraries showed about 500 different designs for Yesu, Elecraft, Bayerfeng, Icom and Kenwood. Though I should point out that Kenwood also makes food processors and other bits that seem popular in the 3D printing world. So 500 is likely a little high, but respectable nonetheless. I looked at eight different libraries and found that Thingiverse is by far the most popular for bits with radio brands we know and love. It occurred to me that right here is the perfect example of how amateur radio is a hobby that just grows and grows. If you're looking for radio mounts, stands, buttons, microphone clips, belt clips, mount adapters, holders, cradles, plug covers, brackets, earpiece retainers, logos, call sign stands, cogs, gears, handles, caps, pins, latches, cases, tuning knobs, CW key brackets, stacking brackets, antenna adapters, feet, desk stands, shoulder strap holders, battery compartments, you're good to go. I should mention that you don't even need to invest in a 3D printer at this point. You can hand a design to a printing service and get your print shipped to you in the mail. If you cannot find what you're looking for, you can fire up a 3D CAD program and get designing to make something precisely to your own specifications. And based on the current tools available, you can even see what it's going to look like by the time it's rendered in the plastic and colour of your choice. I've only mentioned radio bits, but there's nothing stopping you from printing ladder line separators, dipole centers, antenna brackets, tuner cases, project cases for your homebrew contraption, knobs and dials, buttons and connectors, and other missing parts or hard-to-find pieces. If you're using standard components like a Raspberry Pi or Arduino, you'll find cases ready to go for those as well, so the more you look, the more you'll find. The point of all this is that amateur radio is a hobby that goes far beyond someone sitting behind a radio listening to beeps, pops and crackles. Manufacturing and amateur radio go hand in hand and have done since the very beginning. 
but there's no rule that says that you have to keep using traditional tools to build what you're imagining. The sky's the limit, and based on the efforts of CAMRAS, the CA Muller Radio Astronomy Station, Papa India 9 Charlie Alpha Mike, based at the Dwingelo Radio Telescope in the Netherlands, who captured a photo of the far side of the moon using a camera linked to an amateur radio transceiver on board of the Chinese Longyang 2 satellite, even that limit is being explored. I'm Ono, a Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima Alpha Bravo. Deze middags zijn dagelijks vanaf ongeveer 1900 uur te beluisteren. De uitzending wordt een dag later om half elf ochtends herhaald. Alle mail is welkom op het adres x xdvme Dat is ook te vinden rechts boven aan de webpagina van de uitzending in www.p0ete.nl. De Daily Minutes toont iedere dag weer aan de hand van schokkende voorbeelden hoe een hobby mensenlevens kan veranderen. De internetfaciliteiten en studio hardware voor Daily Minutes worden gesponsord door 70megahertzshop.nl. 70mhzshop.nl En microfoon naar retour.